British art artist and writer whose distinctive work with pottery and ceramics has gained worldwide renown. In particular, his pieces tend to work in dialogue with the spaces and histories they are to be connected to. He has received an OBE for his services to the arts, and his book, The Hair with the Amber Eyes, was given, amongst other acclaims, the 2011 Costa Book Award for Biography. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really nice to be in such a cool space. I'm going to drink all this water. Um, most of you seem to have actually come from exams today, so I'm hugely impressed by any of you being here at all. Um, I'm not sure whether to stand or sit. I think I'm going to stand, because it feels, makes me feel slightly more authoritative. Um, I'm going to try and talk to you in about half a, for about half an hour. And, um, and then I hope you're all going to sort of ask me lots of complicated questions, which I will swerve from answering. Um, and what I want to talk about is, is restitution. Um, I want to try and, and work my way through um, a family story, um, my own family story about coming from a, a hidden Jewish background. Um, and talk to you about the politics and aesthetics of restitution, um, both in terms of, of how, I, how I make things and how I write things. And they're going to be images, so you have to sort of not look at me, which is great, and look at those things over there, which are the two screens. Um, because I want to start by saying that in my studio in South London, there are two staircases. Uh, two separate staircases. The first staircase um, is this one, and it takes you up, um, and it takes you up to a space where perhaps we could not have these lights on. Is that possible to 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 not have lights on here? These wonderful chandeliers um, that might make it a little easier to see. Um, so, if you've got one staircase, you you find my space to make pots, and here is my wheel. And this is where I sit, and here I am, sitting with porcelain clay, making vessel after vessel after vessel. This is, th th this is my discipline. This is what I've been doing for all my life. I've been, I'm now in my 50s. I've been doing this since the age of five. I have made tens and tens of thousands of vessels. This is what I do. I'm like a musician doing scales. And sometimes under my wheel is our dog, Isla, keeping me company. And here... Um, I am with my vessels. So that's one staircase, a staircase up towards clay. The other staircase takes you to this space. It's never actually as clean as this is completely ersatz uh, photograph, which is actually a space which has uh, about four and a half thousand books usually stacked up, and also objects and shards, broken objects. And this is a, a space where I write. So one making and one writing. Um, but, of course, the two disciplines are completely interconnected, um, as I will try and navigate uh, today. And this is where, actually, I started to write a story about these objects, these small Japanese ivory and wood objects. They're called Netsuke. They fit in your pocket. Here they are. They're rather gorgeous. Actually, as I left the house today, I picked up two from our vitrine, and here they are today tangled up, of course, with my mask, but here they are uh, from 1760. Small, beautiful, tactile, often humorous, sometimes erotic, um, but absolutely about touch, absolutely about the haptic experience of having something in your hand. And what are they? Well, these objects were co collected in Paris in uh, the 1870s in this beautiful street, the Rue de Monceau, uh, where my uh, Jewish family had emigrated from Odessa. Uh, and like good Jewish families, they'd sent their children out across the world. Uh, half the family ended up in here in Paris. They were hugely well-off um, purveyors of grain. Um, they'd cornered the market in grain and become oligarchically rich. So half the family came here to marry good Jewish girls, and they lived... This is Charles Frissy, uh, who lived in this house on the Rue de Monceau, and he collected these Netsky. The other half of the family went to Vienna. And this man, Charles Frissy, so he's born in Odessa. He comes to Paris. He becomes Parisian. He, he transfers. He assimilates to become Parisian. And what does he do? 
he buys this extraordinary Medici embroideries. This is his bed. You can see, rather shockingly, that the, there used to be an M for Medici on this bed, and he unpicked it and put E for Frissi. So he's that kind of person. Bling is a word that might acquire uh, around a Charles Frissi. And this is what he collects. He collects extraordinary things. He collects Renoir, uh, these extraordinary things. This is in, in um, a Monet, which is in the National Gallery. I occasionally go there and weep that this is no longer mine. Um, and then Degas, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary objects, all in that room in uh, the Rue de Monceau. And he has friends uh, amongst writers, uh, amongst collectors, amongst painters. And he buys these little objects uh, because uh, his lover uh, likes small objects. And they buy them together. It's an extraordinary story. And then, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, he gets rather grand. He builds himself a new house. His taste changes. Uh, he starts buying this kind of stuff. This is Gustave Moreau. Uh, for those art historians amongst you, this is uh, a bit much, I think, is how art historians talk about Gustave Moreau. And he decides, at the end of the century, that he's going to send them as a wedding present to his favorite cousin in Vienna, Half the family in Paris, half in Vienna. So he sends them to, here they go, this extraordinary collection, 274 of them, to my great-grandfather, Victor Efrussi, who's living in an even bigger house in Vienna. Uh, this is all about um, showing, if you're Jewish, that you belong in one place. You, this is not about being a traveling Jew. This is showing where you belong. This is where you've put your feet down. And this, the Palais of Frissi on the Ringstrasse in this great city where all these extraordinary uh, communities in the Austro-Hungarian Empire have meet uh, the great city at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, where the Jews take a, a half, uh, the lawyers in the city, they make up uh, part of the extraordinary patronage of the arts. They are composers, they're writers, there's Sigmund Freud down the road, um, everyone. Uh, knows and is part of this community, extraordinary city, um, of, of Jewish uh, life in Vienna. And that's where these Netsuke come. Uh, and here in this uh, really rather monstrous house uh, with gilded ceilings, uh, this is where uh, they arrive um, because Victor has married um, uh, uh, the Baroness from the palace next door. Uh, here she is, my great-grandmother, Emmy, dressing up in characteristic form uh, as Marie Antoinette. Um, this is one of her less dramatic um, um, uh, costumes. And this is where, and this is her with one of her lovers, um, and this is, this is where they bring up their children. This is my grandmother and my great-aunt, Gisela. So this is where these Netsuke go from being a salon in Paris to being part of a nursery, being part of a family life. Uh, my great-grandmother great grandmother remembers as a child taking them out of a vitrine and playing with them on the carpet. And when you see these, I'm rather bereft of not being able to hand these around to you because they're absolutely, but of course, COVID restrictions don't allow me to hand these around to you. But they are playthings. They're for the hand. And there they become playthings for children. And then you kind of know what happens. This is the house uh, where my, they grow up. And my grandmother, uh, her favorite brother, Iggy, Ignace. And what happens? What happens is that this assimilated family, this is her book of, of, of going to the opera. Um, this is Iggy, uh, my great uncle, who runs away. Um, he's gay. He runs away uh, to New York to become a fashion designer. He doesn't want to be another banker, another Jewish banker in, in, in Vienna. Uh, he runs away. This is his, his fashion design. He proudly told me in his 90s that he was the worst fashion designer in America in the 1930s. And he's right. He was uh, a proud boast. Here he is. But then, of course, there is the Anschluss, 1938, that moment of cataclysm when Vienna turns on its own population. And what happens on the first evening of uh, when the tanks come across the border from, 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 um, from Germany and are met by cheering crowds in, in, uh, in the streets of Vienna is that the house, uh, the door of the house um, is left open by the doorman who's been there for 45 years 
Uh, my great-grandmother is beaten up. Um, she's in her 70s. Uh, my great-grandfather is forced to scrub the street um, of the house outside. And slowly, over the next week, um, every single picture, every single object is taken from them. They are dispossessed of all the things that they have. And most uh, uh, tragically for my great-grandfather, Victor, he sees his library, he was a scholar, uh, taken away, put on a lorry, and it's taken away, an SS lorry, it's taken away down the Ringstrasse and disappears. It is a lost family library, 4,000 rare books collected over a lifetime. And my, great, my grandmother goes back to Vienna, she tries to get them out, she gets them to the house in, in, in Czechoslovakia, and this is this dreadful document of my great-grandfather who manages finally uh, to escape. He manages finally with my father and my grandmother to come in 1939 uh, to, to Britain, becomes an exile. And my great-grandmother, Emmy, takes her life. Uh, she doesn't think she'll be able to escape. So what do you do? What do you do with the story? Here is Victor as a refugee in England. He sits by the fire in Tunbridge Wells with my father, then a schoolboy who speaks only a little English. And he recites Virgil from memory. And particular line of Virgil that my father remembers where in the ruins of Troy, there is a line, lacrimae rerum, the tears of things the tears of things. What do you remember when you see objects? Iggy joins the American army. He fights all the way across Europe. And then after the war, my grandmother goes back to Vienna to a destroyed city. She goes back to the destroyed house, which has been completely emptied, and finds that her maid, has hidden the Netsuke in her mattress and gives them back to her. Everything else has gone. She brings back a suitcase with 274 Netsuke and has them in their house in Tunbridge Wells. And Iggy turns up, a man who cannot live in Europe anymore. And he says, when he sees them, I know what I'm going to do. And he decides to go to Japan. He's never been to Japan. There's no reason for him to go to Japan. But suddenly this collection tells him that that is what he wants to do. So he goes with that attache case. And here he is in the 1940s going to Japan. And he builds a vitrine, a glass case, which is the third resting point for this collection in a new house. And here it is, a new house in Tokyo, lacrimae rerum, those objects, Paris, to Vienna, to a mattress in the conflagration of the Shoa, and then to Tokyo. And there he is with his partner, Jiro, uh, who he lives with throughout his life. And they have dinner parties. They're very good cooks, both of them. They're very good at parties. Uh, when I turn up as a 17-year-old um, in Japan to become a potter, uh, the first thing he does is to give me a whiskey sour, my first whiskey sour. And the second thing, the second day, is get me to go and change my clothes and buy me wonderful clothes in a department store because I'm so shabby. But the whiskey sour is the first thing. And there he is, opening the vitrine of the Netsuke and handing them around and beginning stories. And when they both die, I say Kaddish in a Buddhist temple for my great uncle Iggy, who was buried, born in Vienna, dies in Tokyo. I say Kaddish for him alongside a Buddhist abbot. And then I go back 10 years ago and say Kaddish for my great uncle, partner Jiro, my Japanese great uncle. And you have to say, when you see that grave, that actually that particular journey across places from one place to another, that picking up of narrative, of story, 
but that thread of objects um, is one that is so compelling if you make objects. But what do you do with this inheritance? It's a complicated inheritance. It's made more complicated by the fact that my dad, Victor, named after his great-grandfather, became an Anglican clergyman. He was Jewish, but he became the Dean of Canterbury. So I grew up in the Church of England with a Jewish father who was an ordained Anglican minister. And when his portrait was painted, because all the deans of Canterbury back from the, um, from the Reformation have had their portraits painted, he asked a Viennese cousin of his to paint his picture. She was an extraordinary painter. But she wouldn't allow him to see the picture while it was being, being done. And so there was a great unveiling in the deanery of Canterbury, this great big building, and suddenly the, 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 it's uncovered and she's painted him as a rabbi. And she says, you might be the Dean of Canterbury, but you're still a Jewish boy. And so this portrait of my Jewish Anglican father hangs in Canterbury. So what do you do with this inheritance? What do you do to, what agency can you find in storytelling? What agency can you find in storytelling? I write a book. It's called The Hair with Amber Eyes. I think when I write the book that I finish something. I've managed to uh, stop this difficult inheritance um, uh, being complicated for my children. I want to sort something out. It takes me almost 10 years to write it. But when I write the book, what happens is I start to get letters and more and more letters from people who have had extraordinary, complicated, exilic experiences. Their parents have told them something or not told them something. There are silences in family stories. So what you come back to again and again is the sense that things aren't finished. Family stories are not finishable. That actually that inheritance of a particular story is fissile. It breaks apart in all kinds of ways. And so what I decide to do is this. I go to the ghetto, the original ghetto in Venice. Here it is. This is the place 600 years ago where the first ghetto is created, the first walling up of a Jewish community. And this is an extraordinary and haunted space. And I talk over years to the Jewish community there and particularly to the rabbis there. And they asked me to make an exhibition. It's the first time, it's rather a thing I'm incredibly proud of to be the first contemporary artist to work in the ghetto in these spaces. And I make an exhibition called Psalm. The Psalms are, of course, both Christian and, he uh, and, and, and Jewish, but they're also all about exile. So I make an exhibition which threads its way through these spaces, um, including uh, looking from one synagogue um, out into these spaces. And I thread them through this particular space. And it's very beautiful. It's during the Venice Biennale. People come. Uh, we have an extraordinary experiences there it's, uh, in, in the ghetto. And it's all very beautiful. This I make for the Sukkah, uh, uh, the, the festival of the Sukkot. It's a series of porcelain objects in these towers, um, that very kind of um, delicate towers where, where there's pieces of gold so that the light comes in and catches the gold. But then I decide that that's not enough. I mean, I do exhibitions in lots of different places, but I don't want to just make an exhibition in Venice. What I want to do is to really, truly reflect on what it is to cross a border with a language. So I make this. It's a library of exile. And what you're seeing here is a structure which is about half the size of this chamber. On the outside of this, is, it's a wooden structure on which I have put liquid porcelain. I've used brushed porcelain, liquid porcelain. And then into that structure, I've written um, a whole history of the lost and destroyed libraries of the world, from Alexandria all the way through uh, to the 21st century. 
And it's a history of all those libraries where, uh, by edict, particular holy people from every faith or people of power have elected to burn books or to destroy libraries um, or to uh, uh, um, make bonfires of particular kinds of literature. It's, it's basically, it's a pretty grim history all the way around. And halfway round, um, I, I put, this is personal. This is from my great-grandfather, Victor. And high up, I put the lines of Heinrich Heine, which I think should be written on every single library portal as you go in, which is um, where, they, where they burn books, then they will burn humans. That extraordinary line from uh, 200 years ago from the beginning of the, of, of the 19th century, where they burn books, then they will be at burn humans. Because it's true. It's absolutely true. And I go through all these libraries, and I end up... And then you go in, and it's different, because there are installations, but better than that, <laughs> there are 2,000 books in 80 different languages, all of them written by people who have been forced into exile. So it's a whole extraordinary working library. It began in Venice, it then went to Dresden, it went to the bombed out library in Dresden, bombed in 1945, um, and here it is on its opening night. There was an extraordinary moment when a young Syrian writer turned up and found a book um, in Arabic uh, that she hadn't seen for, for five years. And she is incredibly moving. She stood and read this, this poem in Arabic complete silence. Um, but the, the thing about this library was two significant things. One is that it's a working library. You're allowed to pick books up and read them. The second thing is uh, we asked people to suggest all the books that they felt should be there. On the first night in, in Venice, uh, an elderly man came up to me and said, why no Latvian poetry? At which point I went... I know nothing about Latvian poetry, and the next day he came with a great list of Latvian poetry that I had to buy then for the library. It's a wonderful, expensive, truly proper way of running a library. I might be a potter, but I'm really a librarian. The best thing of all, this is people's suggestions, um, and, they, and they were, you know, by the ends of the show, um, it was also came to the British Museum, um, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of suggestions. And actually, if you go online, you'll see that there is now a website, Library of Exile, where you can suggest books. So that is what happened to the Library of Exile. The most extraordinary thing is at the end of the run of the exhibition, the library in, in London, um, um, we, I've donated the whole of the library to Mosul. So it's now on its way to Iraq, where, as you know, um, the great library, university library, was burned down by ISIS. Um, and so it's going to be part of the new rebuilding of a library of exile. So, lacrimae rerum. <laughs> Not only objects, but books. Because actually the inscription into a book, which is what we invited people to do, there was a book plate inside every book, uh, and by the end of it, people had written from all communities, you know, hundreds of people had written their names um, into the book. Um, it did both the things that you're not supposed to do in libraries. It was noisy, and people were writing in books. It was absolutely fantastic. I was so pleased. Uh, both those, those, those things were, were, were transgressed um, in the library. So, so objects and books, and finally, because how much time have I got? I haven't actually got a watch. And that's, am I allowed five more minutes? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Finally to return to this idea of restitution. Um, for me, this is an act of restitution. It's an act of, of, of restituting the idea that as a refugee or as an exile, you should be welcomed. It's restituting the idea that actually you bring with you such generosity of language and literature with you when you cross a border, that that is in itself an act of restitution. But finally, I just want to talk very briefly about this, which came out a month ago, which is my new book, Letters to Camondo. Um, and, and it's another family story, and it's a complicated one and a painful one. It's a series of 
letters that I wrote. Um, it's about a, a family that lived 10 doors down from me, our family in Paris, in the Rue de Monceau. You remember that beautiful hill of golden stone. It's a, a family, that, a Jewish family that came from Istanbul called the Kamondo. And, and this is the house they built. It's really rather beautiful. Um, and this is the house where this man, um, Moise um, de Camondo, built this extraordinary house. It's, you go in and it's, it's like a sort of um, a fantasy of an of a 18th century uh, Parisian villa. But when you go up a different staircase, not the grand staircase, you come up to an extraordinary series of empty rooms at the very top of the house. I've been going for, for a decade now. And when you get to the top of the house, which you're not allowed to get into, there are these derelict rooms. And in these derelict rooms, there are cupboards and cupboards and cupboards. You open one, it's full of, of, of these are, um, account books for 100 years in an oak-lined room. You open another, and it's full of Louis Vuitton trunks from 1930. You open another cupboard, and it's full of light fittings from the 1920s. And the, the maids' rooms are, are just dusty, extraordinary, haunted rooms. And here in these archives uh, are the archives of this family and this particular man, Moise de Camondo, who here he is with his eye patch, uh, a rather raffish man. He, he marries this uh, very uh, wonderful uh, cousin of, of my grandmother's. Here she is painted by, by Renoir. Uh, and then she runs off uh, with someone else um, in the spirit of Parisian Belle Epoque society, where as far as I can see, well, I'm not going there. All I can say is I have more French cousins than I really thought I could ever have. Um, uh, and he lives alone with his two children and builds this house. And uh, what he's doing is building a house um, uh, which he wants to be um, uh, the epitome, the epitome of, of graceful living. It's an extraordinary um, attempt uh, at making um, himself Parisian. What he wants to do is to show that he's not um, a Jewish um, merchant from Constantinople, but he is someone who could sit down with Voltaire and talk about the Enlightenment. And in these rooms, these are the, the servants' rooms, um, this is where uh, he creates his life. And he creates it because here is his son Nisim, um, who tragically, in the First World War, um, is killed fighting for France. And at that moment, uh, um, um, Moise decides that the whole house is going to become a memorial for him. So he spends the rest of his life until he dies in 1935 alone in this house, creating this memorial. Um, and Beatrice, the daughter, does the right thing. She marries um, um, this young man who's a, a, a not very good composer who grows up in this other family house. This is the house that we should have inherited, I have to say. This is a fake Greek villa um, built around um, a courtyard. This is, real, this is real style in the south of France. But this is where this family grows up. And in 1935, he dies, and the house is given in a great ceremony to France, an extraordinary, everyone comes, the house is handed over. It's a great symbolic act of the Camondo family giving something to France. And then, what happens? What happens is extraordinary. What happens is that during um, the occupation of Vichy, France, there is, like there was in Vienna, this systematic dispossessing of Jewish families from their objects. These are photographs showing objects in storage in, in Jewish houses in in Paris. And eventually, uh, um, what happens is that the, uh, every single object uh, that belongs to the family is taken, and uh, Beatrice and her husband and their two children um, are taken to Drancy concentration camp, detention camp on the outskirts of um, uh, uh, Paris. And these are the cards that I found, these extraordinary cards, which show um, um, that they are to be deported. And in 1944 and 1945, they are taken away and deported on the trains to Auschwitz, where they die. And this is the young son. 
with his dog. These are cousins. And what's left? What's left is an extraordinary house full of art in the Rue de Monceau. It's a memorial. It's a memorial that he created for a son who died in the First War. But actually what it's become is this extraordinary and haunted place where actually the absence of the family is something that is so palpable that I felt the need to try and address what restitution might mean. Now here, there's no family to restitute objects to. That's not the point. But what you can do, and what I hope I have done, is to restitute a story. Because everyone who goes to Paris and goes around this, this beautiful museum and looks at the French furniture and the Chardin paintings and the Sèvres comes away saying what a beautiful house museum it is. But what they don't see and they don't feel is the presence of the family that lived there. So when I talk about restitution, I talk about it in different overlapping ways, that you can restitute objects, objects stolen from you can be taken back. You can restitute an idea, which is what the Library of Exile, I hope, does. You can restitute a library, here's a library on its way to Mosul. Um, and you can make objects like I do, you can mend them, like I do. This is a form of kintsugi, a way of, of mending things which are broken. Um, and you can also send things back out into the world again with a different kind of agency. You can restitute stories back to places. And actually, that surely is something um, that is worth attempting. And here is the tiger that came to tea, the most popular book from the Library of Exile, which had, by the time it went to Mosul, 800 people from different parts of the world had signed their one uh, book plate after another after another. And Judith Kerr, who wrote The Tiger That Came to Tea, exile, emigre, refugee from Nazi Germany, uh, isn't that extraordinary that that story written by someone who's had that kind of experience should touch so many people, and that that book, with all those people's affectionate inscribing of their names should now be in the university library in Mosul. So that's what I mean by restitution. And, and I think I've used up all my time. But thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for that. What an amazing story. Um, I've just got a, a couple of questions from me and then we'll open up to any audience questions people will have. So I guess just on hearing on that, what was the process like for you of discovering that family history, of sort of finding out about it? Um, I think the, um, the short answer is really difficult. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, I kind of grow up with um, a father um, who has a very strong accent but never talks about his childhood, which is a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> so, you know, any of you who are attempting to write your family story, watch out for parents with strong accents who, who are very silent about their upbringings. Um, I think what, what mattered to me, there was a, a moment um, when I was given that whole collection of Netscape by my great uncle, um, when I realized that I felt, I felt a responsibility to the story, that actually these objects, um, I, could, I could go t one of two ways, to be honest. I, I could either anecdotalize about it, say, aren't they lovely? Aren't they lovely things? Do you know they came from a lovely man in Tokyo? Which is one option, or else I could really try and work out what they meant. That took me down s the biggest rabbit hole of all time for me personally, which took me into discovering all kinds of, of hugely, um, hugely painful and complicated bits of territory. It, and it was painful because I grew to love these people. I mean, I'd never met my great, great uncle, Charles Frissy, or, you know, I hadn't met these people. But by the time I'd spent so much time in archives and libraries and walking around their streets and, you know, running my hands over their buildings and, you know, 
trying to find out in Odessa where they lived, all that stuff. By the time I'd done all that, I felt so close to them that, that, that's it, that it became a book. Basically, you can't do things with Google. I think that's my, my, <laughs> my writer's tip to anyone who's doing any, any sort of non-fiction journey is you, you, know, you, you, can, you can do lots of things, but you actually have to go there. And as soon as you go to places, it's, it's, it's so much more interesting and so much more complicated. Yeah. And how do you see, obviously you've written this book and a couple of others, um, how do you see your relationship between art and writing? Um, okay. Um, Sorry, it's a bit of a big question. <laughs> it's an absolutely mammoth question. Um, so I've always done both. Um, I've, I mean, I've made pots since I was a kid. I've also written since I was a kid. Um, and for a very, very long time, I kind of, they were sort of parallel things. But to be honest, I kind of think that I, when I write a book, I think about it as a making, kind of making a text, making, uh, I think of text as an object, which sounds hugely um, uh, pretentious, but actually it's true. I do. I w so, um, you know, The Hair with Amber Eyes is a series of, j of walks around different cities. The new book is a series of letters, some very fragmentary and some much longer. But all of those things, for me, are, are like objects. So um, when I start a project, I'm never quite sure whether it's going to end up as a book or an exhibition. Um, um, and there are similar moments within writing and making, um, which are a sort of form of... Um, um, weighing up words or weighing up objects. That was a rubbish, rubbish, rubbish answer. No, I don't think it was. Well, it was a rubbish answer, but, but that's, all, that's all you're getting today. I can't, can't quite work out how to put that. Do you think sort of seeing books as objects means you sort of perceive them differently or write them differently? Um, I think people have such powerful different senses of what a text is. Um, I... Um, I suppose I suppose that's why I, I like libraries so much. I mean I I love I love the experience of of really of different kinds of books um and and writing different kinds of books as well. Um and I have vast vast numbers of books in my life the whole time. Um I recently did um a project actually which I well we haven't time tonight. Um, I did a, a, a book which was a palimpsest. You, a palimpsests are beautiful. Palimpsests are where, where there's one text and then the, you erase the text, you write over it, or you cover it with something else and write another text. And so what I did was to make a huge um, volume of poems by the Romanian writer uh, Paul Celan, a great poet who wrote in German. I printed his poems um, in English and in German on different paper. And then I covered his poems uh, with porcelain slip. And then I rewrote them by hand. It sounds ineffably pretentious. It's so beautiful um, as a project. And that was trying to make a book where I wanted to rewrite his poems, just respond to him as a poet. And so it's both an object and it's a text. Perfect, thank you, that's really interesting. Do we have any audience questions? Just get. Yeah. It's fine. If you make texts, uh, do you also write pots? Yeah, I definitely write pots. Yes. I mean, when when you see if you see a big installation of mine, um, with you know dozens of objects, it's it's basically a series of. It's basically a series of, of caesuras and pauses and, and groups of words. Um, it's a bit like a kind of Emily Dickinson poem, but you know, gone wrong um, at scale, made out of porcelain. I mean, you know, that's a, again a rubbish answer. But no, genuinely, I write. Pot, I do write pots. I mean, for me, it's for, for the, the 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 absolute truth of that is for me. There's something extraordinary about a vessel because I only make vessels. 
because a vessel, of course, has an interior space, which I think of as a breath. Um, and so, but for me, a, in series of installations, isn't a series of kind of, of, of silhouettes. It's a series of, of contained breaths, which is obviously a definition of poetry. I mean, a, a, a definition that no one would agree with, but I'll, 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 I'll take anyone on for, 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 for talking about poetry. Um, but so, um, yes, I do write pots. It's a really, really interesting question. There's a lady here. Um, hi there. So as someone who's also um, interested in writing about their own complicated family background one day, how was it, how difficult was it for you to navigate sort of being close as, like being a bit too close to the situation is obviously like her ancestor and like family relation to the people you're writing about, but also having enough distance, distance to write the narrative itself and continue with the project? It's, it's, that's, that's an absolutely brilliant question because it's really, really difficult. It's really, really difficult because, you know, your immersion in involvement in, in the family story means that there is almost no, there is no distance. I mean, you're, you're, there they are. These are the people you care about. You know, the, the, the narrative is, is, I used the word fissile earlier on. It's, it's explosive stuff. It's, it, you don't know how writing that story is going to affect you or those around you. But um, one way that I found extraordinarily interesting is to write it in fragments. <laughs> is, is not to attempt to write, um, not to attempt a kind of um, a monocular kind of way of writing. Um, not, not to attempt to write it um, as if it's going to be published, bluntly, but to write it in a fragmentary way, find different voices, find different tangents to kind of approach the different aspects of the family story. That's how I wrote The Hair with Amber Eyes. I didn't sit down and go, in 1868, they arrive in Paris, because I would never, I would still be writing that first chapter, you know, you know 20 years on. It, I just reviewing a book at the moment. I'm talking to her at the Edinburgh Festival later this year, a book by, called In Memory of Memory. It's by a Russian writer called Maria, and then invent a Russian name. It's absolutely brilliant. And what it does is, is to do, um, is, to do is, a ta is an endlessly tangential series of approaches towards her family. And it's, it's brilliant. If I, I'm very glad I've read it after I've written my own books, otherwise I would be... <laughs> hugely influenced by it, but seriously worth, in memory of memory, really worth doing. But write it in fragments, you know, because actually that gives you an opportunity to kind of look at things from all kinds of ways. Um, and, 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 and then you'll find, you'll find that kind of um, narrative structure to allow you both the distance and the closeness. So that sounds really writer workshoppery, but that's really how I do it. <laughs> okay. And thank you so much for your, for your talk. Um, we've been talking about um, writing um, and art. I wanted to ask about photography, especially because of the presentation. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask if maybe photography is able to kind of, you know, put together some of the unfinishable aspects of narrative that you mentioned earlier. So, sorry, so, so, so it's about photography yeah, as... Yeah, I just wanted to ask, how, what do you think about photography and what that can do um, to maybe help write about fraught histories or what, if they can. Um, um, extraordinary. And actually, this book, In Memory of Memory, actually talks about uh, found photography the whole time, <laughs> which is fascinating. Um, so it's, it's, in some ways, it's, a, it's actually a very profound um, um, examination. Um, she talks also about Walter Benjamin a lot in photography. Um, so uh, what she does is to, is to uh, look at family photographs and also found and, and adopt her family through found photographs as well. So w w photography is very is very interesting because of course um, it's uh, um, in some ways you uh, profoundly over identify. <laughs> you know you're seeing. You know photography is fascinating. <laughs> you are you are the lens. You know you are the photographer, and, and so. You know whose gaze is 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 being is being examined. So that's really interesting. 
um, um, it, it, it's it interweaving text and photography is is wonderfully stimulating um, and um, um, I'm immediately sort of I'm sorry I'm now in bibliography mode I kind of I kind of want to start talking about all my favorite texts about about photography but there is a moment which I mentioned in my new book um, where um, a, a, a Proust uh, talks about his grandmother which is one of the great moments of a novelist talking about photography where he says he sees his goes in unexpectedly and sees his grandmother um, his grandmother's very old and he finally sees her as an independent person because he sees her like he's a photographer so he's known her all his life he's got all his memories but there's a moment of capture of an image which he says is like a photograph and he writes about that as an extraordinary moment of of, of disjuncture um, in the relationship, and he, but he makes it as an image. It's extraordinary. So, um, how long have we got photography? Absolutely yes. I wish I could take photographs. But anyway. Thank you. Thank you so. Oh God. Thank you so much for that. That was really moving, and I loved the ha hair with amber eyes a lot. Um, I was wondering, you were speaking about restitution and talking about how one of your family paintings was in the National Gallery. Would you ever sort of start the process of trying to reclaim objects back into your family, kind of like the, the Klimt paintings and the Women of Gold and things like that? Thank you very much. Um, I, um, we, I mean, that, actually, that painting is legitimately in the National Gallery, I'd like to point out. Um, yes, I mean, some paintings um, were restituted in 19... 50s and 60s. Um, there are many which are still lost, i.e. people know that they've been stolen. <laughs> but the most extraordinary thing about that is that last year in Vienna, in a museum in Vienna, there uh, um, researchers who were doing an exhibition about our family found an enormous picture. It's about the size of this absolutely horrible picture but it's a 19th century picture of of horses um it's vast and in the archive of the museum there is a note from 1945 where the museum goes we know that this painting was looted from the Ephrussi family but they're not going to find it <laughs> and it's in the archive and no one has done due diligence in that museum from 1945 until uh, a, a research from the Jewish Museum found it last year, and we heard it yesterday that it's been restituted to us. Sorry, it's my daughter. So <laughs> we now have a picture which is about the size of the, about the size of the this building of horses, life-size horses. <laughs> um, um, and I have an idea of what we should do with it, which is that it should stay in this museum forever, but there should be a text and the text will be written by me <laughs> which is a text about remembering and forgetting and about who owns things and um and theft and um it you know that it should stay there but it should stay there as a restituted object not to us but we're restituting it back to vienna with the story of institutional criminality and racism over 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 generations so that's my thought i certainly don't want it at home and it's not by money <laughs> so there's a lady here just in front of me hello um that was very loud. i was wondering if you could talk a bit more about uh the relationship between paper and the object and particularly paper as a potential kind of material within your artistic practice um it seems there's kind of, in the context of restitution, no matter what happens to the object, it seems that paper is somehow involved, whether that's in the kind of archival um, history of its, uh, of its location or in terms of that text you were just talking about. Um, and I was wondering if you think about kind of, yeah, how, how you use paper in your practice. I mean, that's, that, that, that's a fascinating question. I mean, um, um, well, as, as, uh, as, I, as you surmise, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically an archivist. <laughs> you know, I've spent so long uh, feeling the different qualities of paper and finding, finding things, finding traces, um, very important word, traces uh, for, 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 for stories within archives. Also finding um, the places in archives where paper is absent, where things have been ripped out. Or there's a slide there uh, I showed, which is my great-grandfather's name, uh, crossed out uh, by, by some SS functionary uh, at the moment when all Jews was, were given the name Israel. Male Jews were given the name Israel and female Jews. So, so he, there's his name, Victor, crossed out in an archive. So paper is, is, paper is, is, um, paper is difficult. You know, um, you, you, paper is very difficult. It's not a, it's not a neutral thing to, to pick up, a, pick up a, um, a, a, a something in an archive. What do you do with it? What do you do with it? Well, you record it, you try and write about it, you, you, or you rewrite it, you work sometimes with the palimpsest, like I do with Stellan's poems. Or <laughs> what I've been doing more latterly with the Camondo family is I have an exhibition in that house in October, and I've been writing texts to Camondo into porcelain, uh, which are like letters, and then stacking them. So part of that re-inhabiting of the house is, I've, is I'm putting pieces of paper, which are pieces of porcelain, with texts in different places in the house, so that the house is, 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 is made messy again, <laughs> is re-inhabited by paper, or porcelain. So uh, that's part of a part of a part of a response to your to, to your really interesting question. Um, Writing books is interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things about writing letters is I'm writing letters to a man who died in 1935. Um, and so it's a book of silences because he never writes back. He never rings, he never writes, you know. Uh, but actually, it's a, it's a series of 50, 50 odd letters uh, into history. Um, and of course, uh, there is no response. So, um, one extraordinary edition, um, it, it came out a month ago, the French edition, I wish I had it with me, I don't, um, is absolutely beautiful because what they've done is absolutely incredible because they've, they've, instead of doing the photographs as part of the book, they've inserted the photographs like they've just been left as markers within the text. And some of you will know the writings of W.G. Sebald. Um, um, good lot of nodding in this literary society here. Um, and, and, you know, Sebald would approve because actually what it does is to, is actually talking about photography, is to, is to reintroduce the idea of the found photograph within a book. Um, you know, the, 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 the sense of happenstance um, within it. Um, but what they've done is, is absolutely beautiful. I never thought I'd see it. Um, anyway, it's hugely expensive, so, anyway, and in French. Um, so, having been raised in the Church of England, but with your Jewish ancestry, how does faith or religion play a part in your life? Um, well, I say, actually, in my last letter, that I'm a lapsed everything. Um, which and I say that I am sort of, you know, I'm, I'm Anglican, a bit Anglican, a bit Jewish, very Quaker. Um, I spent a long time in Japan, so I feel very close to some bits of Zen Buddhism. Um, um, I seem to have spent the last couple of years uh, thinking about the Psalms and writing about them um, because they straddle both those traditions. Um, um, I have fiercely agnostic children. Um, so, you know, um, where am I sitting with faith? I don't know, is the answer. It gets more complicated the older I get. Um, I've recently took the installation I made for the synagogue in Venice and reinstalled it in Canterbury Cathedral, um, which is pretty symptomatic of, of 
not, well, actually not, not simply of not knowing where I am, of, of knowing that I'm somewhere in the middle of different things. <laughs> um, um, I believe in lots of things, um, um, actually, and I suppose, you know, I am, I, th I suppose the most deeply um, um, religious experience I had in the last few years was actually that um, there's an extraordinary piece of music called the Chichester Psalms, which were done by Leonard Bernstein, the great comp Jewish composer Leonard Bernstein, which are the Psalms sung in Hebrew. Um, he did it in the 1960s. And um, I designed a performance of this for the Royal Opera House. And so um, to see um, and hear this music in the Royal Opera House, uh, this psalm sung in Hebrew uh, with, with dancers and singers and, and the set that I designed, suddenly I thought really and truly, my goodness me, um, these words actually mean something to me that I'm really sharing tonight. <laughs> Lots of people. Lots and lots of people. <laughs> Hi, Edmund. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering, as an artist, what how you felt as if you had any responsibility to shine light on controversial and political issues, and also where you personally feel your position as an artist is, whether it's to put, give commentary or to give an opinion on these issues. Thank you. Uh, well, I think that's a very interesting question. I, I, I mean, I, I think that... Um, my Library of Exile was a pretty strong line in the sand um, for arguing um, for arguing for the for the the, the valency, the power of um, migration in our horribly polarized and toxic culture of stigmatizing people from different cultures. So, you know, as a child of a refugee, I'm supporting the Re Refugee Council hugely. Um, in fact, we sold part of our collection of Netscape for unaccompanied refugee children. Uh, and um, that's, that's, that's the issue which, amongst many issues, powerful political issues of, of the moment, uh, where I feel I can make my voice heard. <laughs> you know, if I stand up and talk about um, uh, the climate crisis, um, um, no one's going to take me seriously. I'm a potter, for God's sake. But but if I talk about migration and, and storytelling and why that matters, then perhaps I can make a difference. You know, that much difference, but I can actually stand up and count it. And so, I, I, you know, how can you not be involved in the world? You know, how can you not feel... Um, some of the uh, agonizing um, things that are happening in the world at the moment, um, what I can write about or make does that amount of, of, of good, but, but to, you know, um, that's, that's, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. Thank you. There's a lady here in the front row. Thank you so much. This has been so interesting. Um, I was just wondering, a lot of like your exhibitions and stuff, they seem like this like space in which they're presented is really important. And I was wondering if the same goes with their creation, if there's like a particular meaning to the space they're created in, and like if that influences how they're created, be it your writing or your pots. Or um, that's 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 fascinating. Thank you. Um, I mean, yes, I, I profoundly care about where I put things. <laughs> you know. Um, it's not by chance that I make exhibitions in particular spaces or bring objects together. And sometimes those are exhibitions in museums or galleries or whatever. Sometimes uh, the space is actually a vitrine you know, a, a, or, a, or a glazed cabinet or, um, um, or, or gallery or something like that. Where I, I make them myself matters hugely. Um, I'm very lucky. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have a space... Um, in London, um, which is big enough <laughs> to be a, you know, to, to make objects um, and to write and to have different kinds of materials, but mostly uh, the most important thing of all is that it's a testing ground. <laughs> it's to try things out. 
So um, there's a space in the middle which is not assigned to any function where I simply put stuff together and look at it and come back to it and see whether it works or not. And often it doesn't. So um, when you're saying what's the importance of space, the importance of space is, is iterative. It's a space you can look at something and re repeatedly come back to because um, um, it's a bit like writing. You know, you can't, you have to return. <laughs> Everything is about that return to, to, to a piece of writing or to a piece of sculpture to see whether or not it actually has um, that, um, this is where I f my words fall apart, that extraordinary <laughs> ability to hold its own in the world. Um, if it does, then it leaves the studio, but often things don't. Um, and at the moment, I'm in the middle of this sort of morass of trying to make things for the Camondo exhibition for, for Paris. You know, hugely difficult because these are spaces I love. Um, these, are, these are very emotionally charged space for me. No one has ever done anything since 1935. You know, you can imagine. So I'm trying things out and I'm breaking a lot of things too. And that's fine. <laughs> I think that might be all we've got time for, but thank you so much, Edmund, for that incredibly interesting talk and answering lots of questions. And yeah. It's a huge pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>